Hello and welcome to today's um, webinar on behalf of um, our Executive Administrator at the RCCG Central Office and our Chairman, Pastor Angu Iruku. We want to welcome all our pastors and ministers and workers and members that are joining us. Um, the list is uh, increasing by the second, which is always very encouraging. Uh, it's going to be a great day. Um, this is the third of our series. Uh, in the after the lockdown series, church after the lockdown series. And we have uh, been examining what I'm calling the three Ps. The first P had to do with premises. We were trying to get pastors to think about the physical premises that people will be going back to after the 4th of July, by the grace of God. The second was um, the one we checked yesterday, which has to do with... Um, Somebody remind me, what did we do yesterday? Anybody? Go Social on. Distancing. Social distancing. Praise the Lord. So then we are looking today at platforms. So the platforms from which we can continue to minister to people uh, when we resume uh, church. So um, I want to make make you welcome and um, to let you know that um, all our panelists are here and I'm just going to introduce them very, very quickly. Um, the first, um, can, can you help me with my slides, um, uh, the IT team, so I can, um, people can see the panelists as I'm introducing them. Our first panelist for today is Pastor Ayobami Olunloyo. He's the Multimedia Production Manager at Jesus House London. He's also the technical production manager for easily Europe's largest congregation of Christians at the Christian Festival, the Festival of Life. And he's passionate about organizational development, business administration, and good governance. And believe it or not, he just got an MBA from the George Business School, uh, Cambridge, <laughs> University of Cambridge, in distinction. Well done. God bless you. Uh, uh, our next um, panelist is uh, Sharon Olawepo. We are very fond of Sharon at LCCG Central Office because she's dynamite. Uh, Sharon is the founder of Sharon Designs, and she's the executive director of Actualize HQ, an accredited social enterprise. She's a, a visual branding expert, and she helps small businesses also to build their, their enterprise and grow their businesses profitably. She's got over a decade in leadership and supporting roles and works in curating, teaching, and sustaining brands in and outside of the UK. So Sharon has a very good brand online. It's Sharon Alawepo. You find her on Instagram and everywhere else. Um, welcome, Sharon. God bless you. Our next uh, panelist is Daniel Ayo. And Daniel is the creative director at LCCG Victory House in London is involved in various parts of media, from video content production to photography to graphic design and websites. Uh, when I first knew him, he used to do websites and he has uh, expanded his, uh, his um, interest creditably now. He manages Trinity Multimedia Studios. They are based in Kent, England, and they support churches and other companies in various areas of media. He's currently organizing trainings for churches on how to maximize and get good productions out of their church services. And last but not the least is Pastor Titus Echo. Pastor Titus Echo is an accomplished and distinguished marketer, a member of the Chartered Institute of Marketing in the United Kingdom. He's the manager of the resources and enterprise department at RCCG Central Office, and is also a pastor at RCCG Heritage Haven in Hitchin here in Hertfordshire. And he is, of course, is the voice of the pastors, the parish pastors of this panel this evening. You're welcome, Pastor Titus, and welcome everybody. It's going to be a wonderful day by God's grace. Now, um, I, I want to quickly, you know, introduce our subject. Uh, the subject today is, has the virtual church come to stay? And um, if someone can just tap me through to the slide, my slide where it says the purpose of the church. And I wanted to start us off on um, a, 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 a note that might uh, be interesting to our accomplished um, panel. You know, I, I was asking myself as I was preparing for this um, 
webinar. What is the purpose of the church? Because if you remove the word virtual church, virtual before church, you have the purpose of the church. So I was thinking, first, the church is to preach the good news everywhere and make disciples of all nations. Second, the church is to be a place of regular spiritual instruction, thereby bringing and helping believers to come to maturity as Jesus will want us to. And thirdly, the church is meant to be a place of unity and community where believers can grow in their knowledge of a loving father, Jehovah. And finally, the church, I think, is a place from which to show God's love practically to others by serving our local communities in social action and other kinds of uh, charitable activities. So if this is the purpose of the church, let's have this at the back of our minds panel. I'm going to ask a question now. To what extent is the online church relevant to these purposes? And I'm going to start with um, Pastor Ayobami Ulunoyo. To what extent would an online church be relevant to these purposes? Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Yinka. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really grateful for the opportunity. And uh, thank you to the rest of the panelists as well. It's a pleasure to be uh, having this conversation with you. So because of time, I'll go very quickly into the answer. Um, I'm looking at the slide as well, and I see four things here. And I think in, I tend to think in numbers and percentages. Of the four things, I think the first three are easily transferable to the online church, virtual church experience. Very easily. So when we talk about preaching the good news, we can see clearly that that is already happening in terms of online church and being able to share the message. Number one is essentially the Great Commission from Matthew 28, 19 to 20. And that's what Jesus told us, to go out into the world and preach the gospel to all nations. Now, I believe that we're in an age where technology is a necessary tool to achieve that, to reach the entire world of 7 billion people plus where we are now. I believe it's no longer a mission of walking and flying and driving. I think there is a lot more to be done than those mediums can cover. And so we must employ technology. I think that is crucial. Number two is to be a place of regular spiritual instruction. Again, you know, with all the Zoom meetings we're seeing all over the place now, Instagram Live, a lot of teaching is going on online. Again, I think the virtual um, space is very transferable is very relevant to being able to be a, uh, a medium for instructing people in growth in, in Christianity. And number three, uh, to, to be a place of unity and community. We've seen all sorts of things happen online. People have had birthdays, you know, even, even you know, moments that you otherwise you may not necessarily be, you know, I, I don't want to go into detail, but I mean, funerals, all sorts of things have taken place on Zoom because, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. So I think these, these first three things are quite clear. But Jesus also called us to be his hands and feet, you know, to go into local communities and to make a difference and to touch lives in that way. And uh, we see a lot of that in the early church in the book of Acts. So I think, you know, that's relevant, but there is a limitation to that. The Bible also says as well, of course, that, you know, don't forsake the assembly of the brethren. Now, if, I, if you were to ask me, is the future about the physical church or the, or the um, online church, virtual church? Um, it's neither. I think it's a hybrid. And what we see from numbers one, two, and three is where virtual church can be in support, but then it has its limitations. And the limitations appear when you look at something like number four. There is a, a, there's a bit it can do, but to be effective, you've got to get out there. So I'll, I'll pause there so that other people can talk. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Yobami, for that eloquent um, introduction to the discussion tonight. Um, I'm going to ask um, a question now and say, is there a nuanced difference between um, streaming a, a, a church service from a brick and mortar location onto maybe a social media platform like Facebook or Periscope and designing an online church experience that is targeted at meeting an online church audience. Is there a difference or is it the same thing? Sharon. Thank you so much for having me here, Pastor Yinka. And um, I believe Pastor Obami really spoke very, you know, clearly about this as well, that, you know, there's a hybrid that's come into play now. We have the physical church and we have the virtual church. And, um, when we create a virtual church experience, it can only enhance, you know, 
what we what we are saying online. So the message is the same, everything's the same. But you know, we we now need, especially in the in the times that we are now, to think one step further. How can we improve the church um, experience online? So it's not just you know putting the camera there and doing what we'd normally do, but we now need to think beyond you know just streaming. For instance, some people want to be part of a church and physical you know the physical location is a barrier so for instance they're abroad but they want to be a part of the church so we now need to start thinking of ways that we can you know help these people to connect as you know part of the church as opposed to just you know streaming videos or posting pictures but we need to take a, a step further so there is a bit of a difference but it's nothing that we can't handle Thank you, Sharon. I'm, I'm going to ask um, Daniel uh, in a minute and a half before we stop, we pause for the 714 prayer and declaration uh, from the chairman. Um, if I wanted to do, a parish pastor wants to do, can carry out a digital audit of his or her church's online presence, can you just tap on your fingers? What would you be looking for? He said, Daniel, carry out a digital audit for me, that is of our church's online audience. Is it, will you be looking at the website? What, what we're looking we at the website, yeah, we're looking at how many people visit the website, how many, I mean, in terms of your online content, how often do people visit it? What kind of response do you get, to, do you get with it as well? In terms of your, how many platforms are you using? Are you using the relevant platform for the relevant thing? I mean, there are loads of platforms out there. Imagine posting a short sermon on Snapchat. That will sell, that will sell well. You know, so you need to know how many platforms do you have? How many, and then the contents you are producing as well, are they being responded to? Do people respond to them as well? And then if people are responding, what, what are they saying as well? And then um, in terms of that, all about your branding as well. So you might want to look into your branding as well. What kind of message are you sending out? Your message and your branding, are they the same? And then in terms of that, and also um, in terms of your audience as well, are you targeting like a church that is targeting um, young people? It can't be, and you are selling messages to the young people. You can't be selling the same message to the older generation. It won't work. So you need to, those are things you need to put in place as well. And come down, I mean, sit down together, maybe have an online, online crew, online team that will be you know, looking into these things. So in front of your online auditing, you need to be able to okay. know your target. And, the people you are like visiting and the people you are talking Thank to you. as well. Not Thank you. Me. Let's pause for a moment and take the prayer and declaration. I will continue because it's getting really interesting now. So the prayer and declaration is on our webinar um, screens, and it's from Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen. And we will all read it together wherever we are, and God of heaven will hear us and answer our prayers in Jesus' name. Oh Lord. Lord. We are your people, called by your name. We humble ourselves. We pray and seek your face. We turn from our wicked ways. Hear from heaven, Lord. Forgive our sins and heal our land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now our declaration. We declare that our land is healed in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, in Jesus' name. Thank you for helping to say the prayer and declaration. And we are seeing the signs, the crisis is being contained and is getting better and things are getting better and we continue to get better in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to come to Pastor Titus. Pastor Titus, I know you are an experienced marketer. You are involved in digital marketing. That's your passion. You're into sales and other things. Unfortunately, you are also a parish pastor. I'm just going to take us on that theme that we're discussing with Ayo uh, just a few moments ago about you know, a, 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 a digital audit. That is, as a parish pastor, what, where is your shoe pinching? You had to go online during the COVID-19 crisis also. You had to go online in a more intentional way. Where is your shoe pinching? Thank you for the opportunity to be on this platform. Yes, um, the church is about people, really. It's about reaching out for people. And um, the primary objective will be how many people are you reaching out to? That is where it is, because 
that will define the success of every other thing that you will do. Right, in terms of how many souls you will win, it depends on the number of people that are on your platform. Even in finances, how much you are going to carry to manage the church, the physical church, it also depends on the number of people. And then ultimately, your reward in heaven will depend on the number of people. So it's all about the number of people that are coming to your platform. That's exactly what we'll be looking out for. So the primary audit will be your engagement. Okay. You'll reach out to people. So uh, how many people are coming on platforms? Then how do you know that people are coming? Of course, you look at number of views, the number of likes, depending on the platform that uh, you are, the number of subscription to your, to, your, to your channel. Those are the things you'll be looking out for. And then what is very critical is that you must look at when and the number of times people connect with you and how long they stay with you, the duration. Because if you look at, let's say you have 100 people visit on a particular um, service, then, but when you look at the contact time, the accumulated contact time, probably is uh, maybe 200 minutes. When you divide the, by the numbers, of people who attended that, that service, you probably realize that maybe people didn't spend up to five minutes on your platform. You understand? So okay. you begin to look at how are you engaging the people? So it's not just about number. When you go into the detail analysis, you must be able to know whether people are actually staying on the platform whether okay yeah yeah whether they are whether they are on for a very long oh. time otherwise we we'll just believe so, in a phantom war you are talking thank you by past titles but you are talking the language of the experts of the marketers and the social media experts you're talking of analytics i'm just a parish pastor so i just <laughs> want to minister and preach the gospel but we come to that and what i think is coming out is the issue of uh, digital infrastructure and what i think is coming out in the first leg of our discussion tonight is that there is a digital infrastructure that is necessary to create an online church experience and that an online church experience might be more than just streaming your service from a brick and mortar physical location onto a social uh, media or some platform to engage others because um, it, it includes the website, it will include the service provider you are using to go online, it might include social media. How do, uh, you know, because pastors are asking questions like, okay, people are coming, but what next? Pastors want to disciple these people. They want to, to take these people to heaven. So we don't want people to just come and worship and then we can't find them anymore. So have that at the back of your minds because you are going to be speaking to pastors and telling them before we leave tonight, how they can convert, you know, carefully and prayerfully some of those people who are like visiting uh, in a ghost-like manner or quietly and convert them uh, into disciples and bring them to Bible study and perhaps become members. I'm seeing a note on my screen, which is saying, uh, we've got over 1,000 people into the webinar and it's not allowing anybody in anymore. Um, IT, Dickie and William, please help us. Like, we want as many people to get in as possible. Even if you can get in 10,000 people, we don't mind. Just you know, let them come in. Thank you. So, um, Pastor Ayobami, what would a pastor need today to set up a viable virtual church focusing on best practices? Thank you again, Pastor Yinka. You, you can still hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Yeah. Brilliant. Can I, if I may, can I contribute a quick response to the question you asked to Sharon, which is the difference Please go ahead. between yeah, the phys, you know, broadcasting from a physical church to um, um, uh, 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 and creating an online, online, virtual online, location. online experience. Yes. I think, uh, Pastor Titus, you said one very key word just a moment ago, which is engagement. I think that is the key difference. Now, the reason I say that is because as churches, what we have traditionally done is that we have met in physical buildings, created church services, 
And if we did have any online presence at all, it was at best a side attraction. And in the worst case scenario, it was just somebody's toy that they were playing with to see what could happen. It was really not part of our strategy, part of our... So when we met and, and talked about Sundays as organizing teams or managers, and so we talked about what we did in the physical building. Who was at the pulpit? You know, when do the, when do the doors open? You know, you know, what are we doing in the foyer? This, these are the things we talked about. So, you know, the Bible says where your heart is there, your treasure will be as well. The heart was yeah. not really in the online church thing. It was really just a thing. But suddenly overnight, what COVID-19 did is that overnight, our entire strategy was turned upside down. So that this thing that was just this, the, the other thing we did became the primary thing. Now, meetings in, in church leadership, of church leaderships and strategy and, and decisions are now all around the virtual church thing. So my point is that the key difference is that what we did by streaming services before was tantamount to simply just creating a session that people were watching. They were yeah. just watching TV, essentially. What creating yeah. a proper online uh, response is, is about engagement, as Pastor Titus said, but that is interaction. And that's the key difference. Because along with the thing they're watching, there must be engagement. There must be people who are able to interact with people discipleship that's where chat forums and things like that come in actually make what you're watching be a, an opportunity of growth not just watching so i think that's the key difference exactly you you've made a very fine i know you haven't answered the your, yes. your own question but that's a very fine um, addition you've made there so when we are talking about creating an online church experience we are going beyond just streaming the service from our homes or from uh, church premises to an online platform. Absolutely. We're talking about engagement. We're talking about knowing who came. We're talking about engaging them virtually. Absolutely. And we're talking perhaps of even making them members virtually. Absolutely. There has to be something. Please go ahead. What, what will I need if yes. I want to set up a, a virtual experience? Brilliant. For so in terms of needs to actually set up an online presence, one of the things I would say is that an online journey has to be planned strategically. You've got to know what happens at service, service starts and the impact you want to have had by service end. So there are various things that are going to open, uh, happen along the journey. People will come. They will join you. They will pray. You know, they, 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 might, they, they, they will engage. They will give an offering. You know, they might be prayed for. You know, they might be taken separately out of chat to, to be spoken to privately. Somebody may be going through an issue. All these things have to be in there. Now, once you begin to understand what you want to achieve, only then can you then begin to determine the tool that can deliver what you want to do. So there's, if you want to pray for people separately outside, then you have to have something that can do that and so on. But in terms of you know, the question more directly, what do I need to be able to set up online church? If we look at three types of churches, like Pastor Yinka, we talked about, family, unit, church, I, I call it. Father, mother, pastor, assistant pastor, kids, and if you, maybe a few other people. That's one. Option two, Medium-sized church, less than 50 people maybe, and then bigger church, 150 people or more. For me, the key thing is that the infrastructure is very the same. What happens online is that there are a lot of tools that are free. So we must think about two things. Essentially, streaming a service is about two things, capturing video and pushing that video out online. Those are the two things that need to happen. So to capture video, you need some sort of camera device that is going to take that thing in. And then to put it out, you need something that's going to stream it. That's essentially what you need. Now, I said in, a, in an earlier conversation you know, that I had with Reverend Yami on Instagram, that the question that comes to me is what God asked Moses, what is in your hand? And what I mean by that is that there are things we have already. So this little family church, that is the family unit, they have mobile phones. The beauty of that and laptops, the beauty of that is that these are devices that capture those two essential things in the one device. They have the camera to capture the video, and they also have the internet capability on board to be able to stream that video. An example of that is Instagram. The phone that is looking at you capturing that video is also streaming it out. Now, when you start going to bigger size things, it's only then that these mobile phones and devices of that nature start to have limits because you want to record, you want to capture what you've done over an hour or two. You can't put all that over into your phone. Your phone is going to get filled up very quickly. Then you have to start using production cameras and things like that. Now, even then, in a small case, without going into too much detail, there are some cameras that can also stream, medium church. 
And then when you get to big church, you can get big cameras and separate systems to stream. But essentially, that's the basic thing. In terms of where we put it, which is the platform, I've recommended things like a church online platform and solutions like that. Now, that doesn't change whoever you are, whether you're tiny, medium, or big. These are things that are free. They are the same. Quality is the same for everybody. So essentially, you are able to do what anybody is doing using those kind of systems. But depending on who you are and your size, we can regulate what's appropriate. Oh, thank you very much, Pastor. So essentially, there is um, something, it's not a one size fix all solution. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to strategize and say we, are, we want to create a viable online experience for those who worship with us. Yes. And then we are going to choose something that suits us. So if it's just me, my wife and three children, we go for a very simple solution. Yep. And then it increases in complexity. So if pastors need this kind of guidance, can they, can they come to anybody on the panel? Can they come to you, other people on the absolutely, panel? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I am privileged to, to run a production company, uh, PAV Media, and this is one of the things we do. We provide solutions and help churches in the appropriate place that they are. So that, you know, that cannot be done over a one-hour webinar. Those are consultations. We look at what you're doing, and we provide solutions, and our team is able to support that and go out and provide training, which is another key part of the whole continuum of getting this right. So we're able, able to... Okay. Thank you. Now I'm going to ask um, um, Sharon a question, then come back to Pastor Titus. Sharon, how important is social media in this whole mix? That is, we can stream our service online, but then where is the engagement? What happens afterwards if, if we don't have any viable social media presence? Right. Thank you so much for that question. I believe um, social media is very important, and the more as you know, the, the more time we spend, you know, even in this lockdown, it's more evident how, you know, important social media is. I would say, you know, one of the reasons that we probably don't know what impact social media is having because is because of something that Pastor Yobami also referred to. You know, we need to know our intent for going on social media. And based on that, we can then measure our metrics. So, you know, when it comes to analytics, apps like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, they all have these things on there that we can check for free. For instance, it will tell you how many men versus women are watching your, you know, your the videos you put up. It tells you what time they watch it. It tells you where they're watching, watching from, if it's their phone, from their laptop, how they even got to find the link. It tells you. So some people, they only click links or WhatsApp. Some people actually search on Google. And these are viable things that we can use to check our social media and we can know what's effective. And when we know what the strengths and our weaknesses are, then we can leverage. So if we find out that posting at this specific time or posting this specific content, you know, maybe video is better than image, for instance, we can then see, okay, how can we do much of this or much more of that? And then our weaknesses, for instance, if no one is engaging on Twitter, it's also probably linked to something that, um, Pastor Daniel spoke about regards to you know your target audience so for instance if your church is for a you know majority of 40s to 50s I'm talking age age wise now and mm. you're on Twitter perhaps those people are not on Twitter and that's why we're not getting engagement so we need to know what our demographic is and then work towards that so in my church for instance now there's a good mix of you know what would call elders in RCCG, so 50s and above, and children. So we found out that for you know those people, that age range, they're mostly on Facebook, but then we stream on YouTube as well for the people that are more com you know more comfortable, have you know YouTube's account, YouTube accounts, and not Facebook, and things like, like these are what we need to look at. So social media is very important, even on Facebook if you're streaming live. It tells you this person likes your video, add them to your page. So this is one of the ways that we can engage with them. When they're typing in the chat box, we can reply. Sometimes they've, they've got questions, pressing questions that if you don't answer at that point, you might not get another chance. So that's why, again, it's important to have brand champions. So these are people that would actually, you know, know what the mission statement is, know what the, the reason for streaming is, and then act accordingly and, you know, you never know somebody that's never been to church in like like a physical church in 10 years could come across uh, something you're streaming as a church 
and just by connecting with you on that day you know um you know their lives are, are saved another thing that we can use are bots for instance this is something that you know we use a lot in marketing and they send automatic replies so for instance if somebody has joined the page it can send an automatic world a welcome and we're lot we're happy to, to see you here just a message you know and this makes people feel more um cared about which is all that mm -hmm. as human we want to know that somebody cares so these are the things that we can use our social media to you know do to to, to gain from streaming online and things like that Thank you, Sharon. Just to clarify, the bots that you talked about, these are robots that chat with you when you get on these websites. Are you talking about the websites or social media? Where, how come pastors and churches use the oh, bots? I'm talking about on Facebook. Um, Facebook, you can use bots on Facebook. A lot of marketers okay. use it, use it for okay. church as well. So as soon as somebody engages, then it replies based on what you set. Because let's face it, a lot of churches don't have 30 people that can work on social media it's probably just the one person so you want to be able to get an auto responder as soon as possible out you can use that and then based on their reply you can then pick up you know the message so it's not everything that the bot will be able to reply to but that okay. initial response is done by a bot so the, so if i in my parish i wanted to activate a bot on our facebook page today could i do it myself is this something that i am technically competent to do i have to come to sharon graphics uh, sharon along with the consultancy the guides that can actually help it's not something too complicated to do at all um depending on what you're trying to do as well um but it's not it's not complicated but if you okay. need help you can <laughs> Yeah, and uh, yeah, I would uh, I would encourage those who need help with that to approach um, Sharon and anybody else that they know. Pastor Titus, you are a parish pastor, you are a professional, you are inside and outside at the same time. You work in the central office and you also pastor one of our churches. So you've got a unique insight into these issues. As we return to church, to our physical locations in a few weeks, would you dismantle your digital infrastructure or would you be thinking of reinforcing it okay. is it like a necessary nuisance you have to put up with for eight weeks and 12 weeks and you can't wait to get out thank you thank you so much um as uh Ayobami has rightly put it the infrastructure could remain the same but where uh, the infrastructure you have in your physical uh, building are not very effective, because to me, the, the, the virtual uh, experience um, is new for most people. And so we have been able to know, okay, this is what and what I need to put in place. I mean, for example, I was not streaming, you know, before, but I uh, had to just do it. So, Going back, I know that I need to put some things in place to enable the church stream. You understand? So, but for those who already stream, I think they probably will know, okay, these are the things, these are the resources I need to add to be able to effectively stream our services. You know, Sharon has said, uh, it is not just um, maybe uh, as a norm before that, okay, just a, a TV experience, you, you, you understand. But we must be talking about a, engagement because we are certainly not um, probably aware of the number of people that will want to come back to the physical church. So I think that uh, it is very, very good for us to be, to, to be well armed to knowing the fact that we must be ready to begin to feed the people from two platforms, the physical and the virtual. So actually, we must try to upgrade what we already have on ground to effectively do that. Thank you, Pastor Titus. And um, just to say to our pastors, we thank you uh, because you're staying with us. We can see the numbers. Our numbers are steady from uh, the time we hit 1,000. Um, please send, continue to send your questions to us uh, through the chat. Uh, they are being passed to us, and we'll begin to take them in about a minute or two. We'll begin to respond directly to your questions in a minute or two uh, for the rest of the webinar. 
and then we'll also uh, find a way to get one or two voice questions in. But a lot of questions have come into the chat room already. First, um, Daniel Ayo, you are in a church in Victory House, London, where you guys have um, launched successfully a radically successful youth church. Now, is the virtual church does it have any role to play in this that is 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 um the digital church the magic bullet we've been waiting for to get the millennials and generation z back in church is this the magic bullet all right so the so so you did, let me just get the question right you're asking the role of the like the yeah. main other church, the role they play in the two questions. That is, did it have anything to do with the success of your youth church? And do you think this is the magic bullet we need to to sustain well, to attract the millennials and generation Z? Well, to to put it this way, the youth church themselves, they are doing a great work. I mean, in terms of I mean, they are young people anyway. So just like Sharon said, they are young people. They are out there with their social media stuff, tagging and sharing and all that. So the mother church, what the, the mentor and the mentor did was before this lockdown, lockdown if that makes sense in terms of looking at them, just trying to see the way they do things. But now that we are now in the virtual world, everything's now online, they are doing great work. In fact, greater work than what we've expected. I mean, in terms of their video, is it the video production? They've been part of us before, so they've learned everything they need to learn. So now they are using it. So even though now, to them, it's like a lot of work they are doing now compared to back in the way they are still in the building. So yeah, what, what, what I would say in summary is that they are doing far better than we thought they, you know, they could. So and everything is working well with them. So even in the future now, when everything, maybe when we get back to, to the main building now, or to, to uh, I mean, our local choices and all that, so maybe they will probably just find a way to like, do like Pastor Adam said, do it like a form of hybrid. Maybe sustain, I mean, keep the keep the online going while we're attending to those who are coming to the building. Okay. If, if, yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Sharon, you are the ultimate millennial. <laughs> Tell us, is this the silver bullet we've been looking for? Is this what we need to invest in to get the attention of our younger people? I believe it's very, very key, social media. Um, for instance, a lot of people do not actually, or, or a lot of millennials, should I say, do not actually still have that connection with their home church. But you will find that they, they're, they're watching American churches online. And it's just amazing to see that, you know, they still believe that I can still, you know, I can still connect to God. I don't have to be there physically. Obviously, we know that we cannot be, forsake the, the gathering of brethren but this is a, a good place to start for us and it's mm -hmm. easy to share it's easier should I say because if you ask the average millennial let's go and evangelize at social so and so station the chances that they will turn up it's not that great but if you said share this share this video they're more likely to do it and then you you're not only you know witnessing to the people that are in your physical location but your thousands of followers as well so i believe this is definitely a key for us in this time for us to be able to move you know move into the millennial generation and just you know watch god do his work so yeah definitely thank you sharon now maybe you quickly answer a question that's coming from pastor sunday fajoni and he's saying could sharon Olawepo explain a bit on where to gather all those data from our social media platforms, as she mentioned. Where, where should Pastor Sunday Fajori get this data from uh, on Facebook, in his Facebook account? Or is it a bit too complicated for, for now? It's not something that we can, because every platform is different. But usually, I'm going to use Instagram for, for an um, example. You need to be using like a business profile, first of all. I know a lot of churches have, you know, just a normal, Facebook account, but you'd need to be using like a Facebook page, Instagram page and things like this. And it gives you more insight. And then if yeah. you were to click on Instagram, if you were to click on, you know, the three dots, it gives you options and then you can go back in. Even for the stories that you post, 
you'll be able to find it. Now, this is something, like I said, varies from platform to platform, but it's there. Um, mm. Even videos, at the end of the videos, it tells you that you have so, so, and so people that watched it. If you, you know, follow that link, it would show you more with regards to, you know, how long they stayed for on average and things like that. So that's a very important point, and um, unfortunately, what you're advising is that some of the churches might just have to dismantle uh, gradually their Facebook pages because I keep getting this request for Facebook friend pages for churches, and if Facebook doesn't catch up with them first and stops their accounts, they can't get the benefit of having an organizational account. So that's very important. We need to open Facebook pages for organizations, for our churches, and uh, dismantle. I know the temptation is that you want to ride on the crest of your friends who are on Facebook, but then it's, uh, it backfires in the long run. Pastor Ayobami, there's a question from Pastor um, Rufus Araoye, which says, some participants log in, they mute, or disable the video, but perhaps they are in the bathroom or kitchen cooking. How do we know they are even engaging and how can we keep them engaged? <laughs> okay, that's a very good question, but it suggests that the platform that is being used is a platform like maybe Zoom or what we're on right now, um, um, go to a webinar where we're supposed to be seeing each other. So again, we, you know, Sharon helped with this earlier and I mentioned it as well. We really need to know why we're online and what we're trying to do. So if, if the essence is to have a congregational approach, because if you're really in physical church, it's one to many or a few to many. We are ministering to people, we're sharing the message, we are leading worship and things like that. We don't always, and, that, and, and we can, and sometimes we should, but that's what we would do in a small group setting. If you're having Bible study, we sit in a circle or something, and then have that. Now, that you can do if that's the essence of it. But if it's church service, then I would not recommend using, you know, everybody talking to each other, Zoom type approach. So if it's a church service, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a broadcast. There is opportunity to feed back through chat, but it's a broadcast from a few people to many people who are benefiting from that. Now, once so, we... So Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah, complete, complete your thoughts. So I was just going to say that if we're doing church service, that's what I would recommend. If we're doing small group, which is interactive and everybody talks to everyone, then I would recommend those kind of forums where we are all interacting. But with that, what you have to have is what you might call ground rules, you know, which is you, are, you, you agree that, you establish that. If you're coming in, first of all, we know who's coming in. We have agreed to come in. And we've agreed that if we're coming in, we're seeing each other. And, and, there, and there are good reasons to do that, reasons such as security. We don't want to have people on that we don't know and we think it's somebody else that's not the person. You know, we've seen impersonation and things like that happen on Zoom recently. So if you want to establish it, you know, because if you physically were sitting together, you wouldn't allow somebody there to put a box on their head and say, you know, we don't know who you are, but we're all sitting and hoping that we can, ch we can chat. We all want to see each other. You know, without going into other discussions, but you, you get what I mean. We must really think about how things would normally be and try to replicate as much as possible those ideas and effects online. So I think it's, it's, it's agreeing what the rules are in those kinds of forms. Grand rules are important. So what you're suggesting, Pastor Ayobami, is you're saying that um, it's not a one platform fix all kind of services and meetings. Yes. That is so you have to choose which platform is best. If you are broadcasting on a Sunday service, maybe it's no good to use Zoom. Exactly. And I certainly would not recommend that because a church service in reality is not a democracy. You're not sitting there and everybody say what you want to say. You know, you tell me what you think. And that's not what a church service is. A church service is a shepherd leading sheep. And that's critical. Yeah. Now, if you, are, if you choose to be sheep under this ministry, under this shepherd, then what is expected, I think, and, and this is not to say that there's no opportunity to talk or feedback and all that. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm saying that the time of administration is from a pastor, a leader to a congregation. It's not, you know, and then, you know, okay. if the pastor asks a question, great, you can answer. But Zoom is, expects that everybody is talking to everybody, you know, and that's not necessarily. So, so, yeah. 
Zoom is more collaborative and a YouTube exactly. page would be better to stream a church service. Precisely. For instance. And that, that, let's stay with this uh, line of questioning. Aki, Pastor Akin Davis from RCCG Fountain of Love Glasgow is saying, in terms of cost and budgeting, how much will it cost an average church? That's difficult to know what an average church is. But how much will it cost an average church to set up a minimum viable visual stream? Um, for instance, is in, that to uh, me? What, what should we be budgeting? Is that to me? Yes. Okay, thank you, sir. So, so if he's asking uh, for the minimal cost, the answer is zero pounds. That's it, zero pounds. Because what is needed, he probably already has. He's asking for minimum viable, right? I think yeah. the answer is zero pounds. But as you said, Pastor Yinka, it's not, you know, there's nothing such as an average church. It depends on what it is and what the circumstances are. Is also dependent on what you can what you can afford. So without being funny, I really do mean that it could be as little as free. It literally could because platforms that are professionally done that you can go onto they exist free. We know that you and the yeah. ability to put it out that could also be free because you can have a phone that can do that. And maybe people maybe what we need to debunk tonight is the myth that all these things cost money and it has to be big. And I know that that is true in churches. We all think about these big, grand things. But I also want to use the analogy of a baby. Hmm. You would expect a baby to crawl before walking. If you saw yeah. a baby on the road running 10 miles an hour, little tiny baby, six months old, you would probably freak out and run away. Yeah? <laughs> the point, the reason I say that is because a lot of our churches maybe some churches, uh, we see what other people are doing, we aspire to it, we think it's great, but we're aspiring to too much based on where we are. And that's not a bad thing. You, you know, it's not, it's not like you cannot aspire to stop, but I'm just saying that what needs to be done is people see you, engage with you, enjoy your service, and they are growing as a result of it. You can do that without spending money. What we can Thank do you. Now, is to help you to see how to train you to do it and to help you to actually achieve it. And I think that's important. As I said before, as the thing grows, you can buy big equipment to do big things. Thank you, Pastor Ayo. And um, um, one or two people have asked and said, will they get your profiles and um, your contact details? And uh, if that's okay, we can put it, update the slide when we send it out and people can contact you guys and then um, they can get uh, some help. Yes. Pastor Titus, there's a question from Kaz, Pastor Kazim Balogu. How do we, with a virtual church that is uh, the Vogue now, uh, it can be quite challenging for our elderly members who may not be tech savvy. So how do we keep them integrated so that they don't feel left out and become disinterested before COVID-19 is over? All the uh, elderly people will have just switched off. <laughs> yeah, certainly. I've been think, thinking about that. I think that's that's a, a challenge that we're going to experience because when you consider your target audience, then you see that you can have various demographics to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, the physical location, the church used to be a church for everyone. That's the mantra we have, church for everyone. Everybody comes in and then one word for everybody and all of that. But when things have gone virtual, I think there is a slight challenge that we will face there because it's a combination of both youth and all of that. Why am I saying this is that when you are going online, you need to be mission specific. So if you want to target the young people, want to target the other people, or just any kind of uh, uh, demography you want to focus on, and that is where your strength is. You know, mm -hmm. some focus on um, the less privileged, some want to deal with poverty and all of that. So when you have these different target audiences, then what you have to do is to be able to focus. Now, what I would say is that you probably have to segment your service or segment the people because that's where marketing segmentation will come in. Because if you continue to dish at us, we have all agreed one message for all, then 
so will be left uh, behind. If you send, if like, you send like, a, a TikTok like, message to somebody who is 60 years old, they are going yeah. to wonder, they, what is TikTok for God's sake? <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> so oh. you would think you, you, oh. you've sent that pastor's message because it was sent by Sharon, <laughs> but only Sharon and her friends got to see the message. <laughs> So, so that that that's that's that is the challenge we, we I mean we will face, and currently it is. So, uh, what I'll probably think about is just look for the best way, the best approach to reach different segments of people. Uh, those who are tech savvy, you can go on with that. Those you have to reach probably through telephone, through emails, and any other kind of means that you think would be effective in reaching those people then you probably have to just focus on that depending on your mission and the kind of people you want to reach and sometimes your congregation already defines your people anyway yeah. <laughs> already there if you are you me know, if if they, if, they, if they are on facebook if they are on facebook you don't need to yeah. worry yourself about taking them to instagram because Instagram, uh, so just set up them and focus on this people and the platforms that they are in. Exactly. Okay, there's yeah. a question coming in about music. This is a challenge our pastors have been facing since the online church experience began. Try playing music in a Zoom room, it's uh, chaotic. And I don't know. So, um, Daniel Ayo, you are into music too, you are a worship leader too. What, uh, what, how can pastors get the best music experience at this time? All right. Uh, well, as we all know, I mean, what people say about this, that music is not really too good on, on Zoom. It's made for just look what we are having now. So imagine Sharon bringing out her keyboard to play. That would just you know, turn into chaos or whatever. But on Zoom, there's still some settings you could do that will enhance your music as long as the instruments are not too much. If it's just a guitar, yeah, fair enough. If it's just a keyboard, fair enough. But if you are plugging a guitar, you are plugging a mic, you are plugging a drum set, uh, you know, we, we don't want to do that. But even on Zoom, there's still some settings there and there you can do to enhance your sound, which will make it clearer. And also your connection as well. So for example, now I'm facing a camera and I'm talking with open mic and all or whatever. I don't want to do that using Zoom. If I, want to, if I want to play music on Zoom, then I want to get some audio interface, I want to get some proper mic. I want to connect everything to my computer, and they use that to connect to to Zoom. That makes it at least a bit, a bit better, even though it's not like 100 okay. So that's just one of the solutions. Yes, Zoom music is not okay on Zoom, but then if it's just one instrument and maybe one singer, that's fine. Use get your audio interface, some USB, connect it to your computer, get a proper mic, like maybe a USB mic, connect it to your interface, do some settings on Zoom, which I can I can start to explain that now. Do some settings on Zoom that will enhance your music a bit. And when you're presenting that to the world, okay, I mean, it's not the best solution ever as in Zoom, but at least for that Zoom and your music, that will enhance it to some extent that people can hear it and understand what you're saying or singing or playing. That, that, that might be um, a very, very important uh, contribution you just made now, Daniel, because I know that majority of uh, LCCG pastors are on Zoom since the lockdown began and it's been a challenge for us on how to get quality music in for the worship so i'm sure you might be getting lots of calls after that um can i ask um pastor adebola ononuga to go ahead with your question you've been unmuted pastor adebola ononuga please go ahead thank you pastor inga yes, sir. and uh, thank you to all the panelists i've been listening to the discourse right from the onset. And I want to tell you clearly that virtual church has come to stay. We need to change our orientations as pastors and ministers of God. If what the scripture says in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, is anything to go by, virtual church will help us to reach out to a lot of people than staying in one single place. Not only that, if you look at all the social media, Twitter, Facebook, name it, Instagram, the chunk of the people we are targeting within the church setting now are the youth. We don't want to lose them. 
And you will agree with me that these youths are always on their phone. Yeah. Even when they move out of, the, of their respective home, if the virtual church is still on, they can still connect with the church wherever the church is, rather than you know listening to all sorts of heresies here and there. You can okay. keep track of what they are doing. And lastly, what one thing I want to say quickly is that you can inspect any website by simply right clicking on the website. You can web scrap information, download data, analyze the data. And the, 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 the insight from the data will tell you the kind of things you need to improve on and the kind of things that you only need to probably keep doing. Okay. So there's a lot you can do with your data. You can do some web scrapping. You only need to write one or two programs to do that on the internet. Thank Wonderful. You. Only one or two programs. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Adebola. That might be like getting the head of John the Baptist for some of us. Um, um, so, but websites is important. And he did say websites. And I'm thinking how many churches really do have websites and how many have valuable websites? But, uh, I, Pastor Ayobami, do you have something to add to what was just said? Thank you very much. Um, Pastor Yinka, I wanted to give a little bit of a strategic slant to our conversation so far. We've talked about solutions. We've talked about things that are near technical and trying to make it work, the how. But I wanted to sort of paint a more strategic view. I think that we must be very, very conversant with what COVID-19 has done. Pastor Titus said something very significant before. You know, when 9-11 happened, September 11, 2001, it changed the world. Right now, we yep. cannot go on aircraft any longer with certain, over certain quantities of liquids and things like that. The world is a fundamentally different place because of that day and the rules have changed. I believe that that is what COVID-19 has done in terms of what the world is. The truth is, I, I don't think that we have understood the effect of it yet until we begin, i.e. as churches, until we begin to go back to physical church, which is what the essence of this webinar is about. Pastor Titus said something critical before. It is only then that we will understand what people have become in their response to church. We don't know mm. who's going to come back. We don't know who has now understood that I can actually experience church from my home. So to answer your question as to do we continue investment and building infrastructure of virtual church, the answer is clearly absolutely we must. We have no choice because people may expect that that is the way church is going now. If you left exactly. eight weeks ago with a thousand people in your churches, 500, you could be coming back with the equivalent of 500 or 100, respectively. Yeah. And nobody really knows that. So we must be in a position, the moment church doors open again, the first thing I would recommend to a lot of churches to do is to gather data. We must understand yeah. what has happened, how people have changed. Uh -huh. And only then can we really address what needs to happen. So one last uh -huh. thing, Pastor Yinka, I just want to say that I think of the church as an army. And what that means is that we have to be a fighting force that is ready. Now, if you want to have a fighting force that is ready to deploy in any physical army anywhere in the world, what do you do? You do drills. And I believe that COVID-19 was a drill for the church. I think there are potentially other things that can challenge the church's position in being able to deliver its message. So as we know, no, the message is timeless and the messenger is the same. But what, 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 sorry, what I was trying to say there is that the mission and the message are timeless. They haven't changed. But the method and the messenger, that's what changes. We must now respond to the situation with the tools available today. And that's critical. And I think that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Pastor Ayo. Then in 15 seconds, a final word um, from Pastor Titus and Sharon, then Daniel, because it's eight o'clock. Pastor Titus, what is the most okay. important message you want to leave us with? Yes, the focus will be on leading people uh, to heaven as much as possible with this new experience that we have. It has come to stay. If it hasn't come to sell, if it is anything to go by, it is that we have another way of expressing and reaching the people. This is one method. We must cash on that and win more souls to God. 
So the virtual church has come to stay and we must use it to accomplish our CCG's vision and mission statement. Sharon. Yeah, I think what I would say is just to analyze the data we have so that we can leverage to get the best fruit that we can forward. So we should identify what's working and then improve on it and identify what's not working and see any opportunities and threats that we've you know, encountered in that and try to make it you know, better for the course of the gospel. Thank you, Sharon. Finally, Daniel, your final word. Has the virtual <laughs> well, church well, come to stay? Yeah, well, it's come to stay, and there's nothing we can do about it. We just have to adapt. And one thing I'd like to say, borrowing some words from Pastor Rebani, is let's try and go for the best. Like you mentioned about Zoom, Zoom is not always the best. There are some other platforms that you can use that will give you a better result that will do a better content name 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 one or two quickly well if you, you can use you can use a video a pre-recorded video streaming via obs and maybe use restream or use stream yard that's another what, is, what, is, what is what is obs <laughs> obs is a, it's like a software you use to send your video out so if i'm using obs now i send my video to obs from obs I do stream key and all that to the stream and i select my multiple platforms which get out to all the world so you have the opportunity of streaming more to more than facebook or youtube at a go you can do periscope you can do twitch and all the, uh, and all the stuff out there yeah so and i'll just it. say so, oh, so there are higher. so there are intermediary so, mediums intermediary mediums that we can use for our online experience rather than just go directly to to social media that's what you, you just said Pastor Ayo, did you want to mention one or two our pastors can explore before we pray? Absolutely. I mean, OBS stands for Open Broadcaster System. It's a, very, it's a pretty good software that is free and is created um, to be able to stream video. So I, I agree with uh, Ayo. That's very recommendable. And uh, there, are, there are a lot of other systems, but I think it's more important to pray now. So if people want to find out more, I'm happy to be contacted and we can talk about that. So. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. So it's not it. We have to strategize and we have to do it uh, just like we do any other business because this is the, the lost business and it requires haste. Let's uh, say a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We bless your name. We thank you for your children that you've used to speak to us, to open our eyes, to encourage us. And just, we thank you for all the pastors that logged in. We thank you for the knowledge and things that they have gleaned from this meeting. We thank you for our colleagues that helped in the back at the IT end to make sure everything worked well. We thank you for our leaders. We thank you for Pastor Mo, Pastor Agu, and the trustees and all our leaders. We just pray, Lord, that you will walk, you will cost. COVID-19 to work together for our good as a church in the name of Jesus. Pray that Lord will become even more focused and much more enabled to carry out the mission and vision of the redeemed Christian Church of God in the name of Jesus. Thank you, our Heavenly Father. We return all the glory to you. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. and Have a happy bank holiday uh, tomorrow and see you very soon. Bye. Nice. Thank you very much. Thank you.